You're cruising the solar system in an extraterrestrial starship. You're on life detection watch, manning the sensors. Is there life in this solar system? Is there intelligent life on Earth? Another wild ride on science without walls. Many people are fascinated with the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligences, ETIs. Is there life on other worlds? How would we sense and detect it? If it followed an evolutionary development in any way comparable to ours, extraterrestrial life might be far more primitive than the life we know. Ours began nearly four billion years ago with primitive prokaryotes. How would we detect prokaryotic life forms? If life elsewhere started much earlier than it did here on Earth, might it have advanced much further? Could we even begin to conceive what that intelligent life might be like? Could we sense or detect it? Does it know we are here? Can its sensors detect our signals? Could we receive the signals that it might be sending our way? In 1990, as the Voyager 1 space probe was in the vicinity of Neptune and on its way out of our solar system, Carl Sagan and the administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, had the control team here on Earth reorient the Voyager spacecraft so its cameras could look back at the planets it had already passed, including Earth. They photographed Earth and several of the other inner planets. This is the Earth from Neptune, from the outer fringes of our solar system. It's so small you may not be able to see it on your TV screen. In Carl Sagan's words, it's a pale blue dot. This is what Earth looks like to an alien spaceship approaching our solar system. What that spaceship sees, what it actually detects, is dependent on the instruments it has available. Well, let's pretend you are on that spaceship, on life detection watch, manning the sensors and the instruments. Your starship will coast into our solar system until it gets quite close to planet Earth. The rules of this encounter are, thou shalt not touch. The starship or its probes cannot enter our atmosphere or even get very close to our planet. That's not allowed in this game. Let's assume, just for a moment, that the detectors you have for this mission are your own senses, and you're standing there on the bridge looking at that pale blue dot in the distance. As you start to travel towards Earth, you travel among the outer planets and investigate their atmospheres. You have spectrometers on board. You have ways of measuring the electromagnetic radiation, either emitted by or reflected or scattered from the various planetary atmospheres. You are familiar with the atoms and molecules in this solar system. You know their characteristic spectroscopic signatures. You know their absorptions in the visible region of the spectrum and in the infrared and indeed throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. You have efficient means of analyzing the gas content of the planetary atmospheres. You don't need to rely solely on your senses for this mission. You have extended your senses by using the scientific instruments on board. Yours, of course, is not the only starship that has explored and examined this particular solar system. You have data on file on these planetary atmospheres and how they have changed over time. You know that the major molecular constituents of the atmospheres are nitrogen and carbon dioxide. You and your colleagues understand the chemical reactions that go on in planetary atmospheres, particularly those close to the sun. The intense ultraviolet radiation from the sun produces a chemistry which is now well understood. The atmosphere of Venus 
is almost all CO2, with about 2% nitrogen and just a trace of oxygen. Mars is 95% CO2, about 3% nitrogen, and again, a very small amount of oxygen. Earth lies more or less midway between Venus and Mars, so you expect Earth's atmosphere to be comparable, maybe 98% CO2, 2% nitrogen, a trace of oxygen. You also have infrared thermal sensors. Venus's temperature approaches 500 degrees centigrade, Mars about minus 50 centigrade. So you expect Earth's surface temperature to be in the range of um, 200 to 300 centigrade, much, much hotter than boiling water. You also have other kinds of remote sensing instruments on board, such as infrared lasers, which can send out radiation of a certain wavelength and look at that reflected or scattered radiation coming back. You and your coworkers know how to interpret that decreased return radiation signal in terms of the concentration of gas in the planet's atmosphere. You can also use light radiation, visible lasers, to make similar measurements. These various spectroscopies enable you to figure out what is the molecular composition and the concentration of planetary atmospheres. And you make these measurements while abiding by intergalactic exploration ethics. Thou shalt not land, thou shalt not touch. You are allowed to touch only remotely and indirectly through electromagnetic radiation. So, as you approach Earth, your spectrometers begin to detect the actual composition of the Earth's atmosphere. It is not an average between Venus and Mars. Earth's atmosphere is about 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. It's also high in methane, a gas not normally found among the other planets. The high oxygen content of Earth suggests that the methane should oxidize in the presence of oxygen and ultraviolet radiation to form carbon dioxide and water. The fact that there is a significant concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere suggests that there is a means of continually producing methane on Earth. And the very presence of high amounts of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere suggests that there is an active production source on Earth. Otherwise, that oxygen would all be bound to carbon, producing the high CO2 concentration, which is what we find on the other planets. On the contrary, the CO2 level on Earth is unusually low. Earth's atmosphere is very, very unusual. The total gas compositions suggest that the atmosphere is really very dense. It's not just that it's high in oxygen and nitrogen and low in CO2. The actual concentrations of the gases, the density of the atmosphere, is very high. And that must be why the surface temperature of the planet is relatively cool. There's some sort of insulation mechanism or reflection mechanism which prevents many of the photons from the sun from being absorbed and transferring their energy to produce heat on the surface of the planet. Your thermal sensors show that Earth is over 200 degrees C cooler than you expected. The average surface temperature is only about 13 degrees centigrade, incredibly low for a planet so close to the sun. Your sensors also detect a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, another very unusual observation. Water is a rare and unusual molecule in much of this solar system. You're now close enough to see with the telescopes and cameras that Earth really looks different. It appears to have a morphology, a structure. There are alternating areas of blue and red or green, very unlike the more homogeneous color that your eyes and optical spectrum sensors on board detect from Venus, Mars, or the other planets. You consult with your scientific colleagues and quickly come up with a model for planet Earth. Your observations and models, based on the images and the chemical data, 
suggest that it consists of relatively dry land areas with an unusually high concentration of green pigments. It also shows that three quarters of the planet's surface is apparently water. The model further suggests that water vapor apparently condenses in the atmosphere into white structures, clouds, giving the planet an eerie blue, white, red, and green appearance, with the white part more or less shifting around the surface of the planet. We know that Earth's position from the sun, and we know the amount of solar energy received by Earth. We also know the solar spectrum, and although it has an infrared and an ultraviolet component, much of the energy is in the so-called visible region of the spectrum. We know that much of that light is absorbed by the molecular structures on the surface of the planet. Our sensors also suggest that much of the ultraviolet radiation impinging on the outer surface of the Earth's atmosphere probably does not fully penetrate, that there is something in the atmosphere which absorbs the ultraviolet radiation. Your spectral information suggests that it's an unusual oxygen molecule, O3, ozone. There appear to be major regions of the planet's surface in which this molecule is apparently depleted and ultraviolet radiation must penetrate all the way to the surface. But the rest of the planet's ozone layer apparently absorbs that solar ultraviolet. All of these complex processes apparently result in that 13 degree C average surface temperature. Your data allows you to develop a model of the Earth's atmosphere. There are several layers. The moderate troposphere, extending out to perhaps 20 kilometers from the surface of the planet, and getting thinner and thinner with altitude. And from 20 kilometers out to about 50 is the stratosphere, also thinning with distance. There seems to be little vertical mixing in the stratosphere, but a great deal of vertical and horizontal mixing in the lower troposphere. In the lower regions of the stratosphere and above the troposphere is where ozone appears to be the most concentrated. There is an ozone layer there. As you've come closer to Earth, you've learned that there are other gases in its atmosphere. There are some nitrogen oxides, some ammonia, and some dimethyl sulfide. It's a rich, diverse, and fascinating atmosphere. You're very confused, though, by the very high amount of oxygen in this atmosphere. On the other planets, any water vapor is acted upon by the intense ultraviolet radiation from the sun, breaking the water down into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is such a light molecule that it eventually diffuses out into space. It isn't heavy enough to be held down by the planet's gravity. Water breakdown does account for some of the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, but certainly not for so much oxygen. Not unless there were some means by which the visible radiation, not just the ultraviolet, could break water apart. But there simply isn't enough energy in a visible light photon to break the chemical bond in water. So the high oxygen content in this atmosphere is a real mystery. The land areas of the planet are rich with green pigments. Some of the large blue areas also have green pigment, and sometimes a red pigment, which seems to be somewhat fluid, unattached, floating on the surface of the water. You are confused. Your advanced sensors also detect the composition of those blue regions, the planet's oceans. The water contains many of the elements in the solar system, in the solar periodic table. Perhaps two-thirds of the periodic table is represented in the Earth's oceans, although the most common elements are sodium, magnesium, calcium, potassium, chlorine, sulfur, carbon, bromine, and of course, hydrogen and oxygen. There is an enormous amount of radiation in the visible region of the spectrum emanating from this planet even during its night. There are obviously many means of producing luminescence on the surface of the Earth. The regions of luminescence match with the land areas of the planet. 
Your electromagnetic sensors have also been receiving emissions from the planet, which are very different from the typical background electromagnetic spectrum in the solar system. Some of these emissions are in very narrow frequency ranges. And they appear to be ordered and patterned. In fact, you have intercepted some of these emissions emanating from what appeared to be small, primitive Earthen spaceships, perhaps beaming or directing such signals back towards planet Earth. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You conclude that these radio frequency emissions emanating from Earth and apparently being received by Earth are intentional and are perhaps a sign or some evidence of intelligent life. Your computers have now deciphered the code of these unique emissions. Apparently there is life on Earth, apparently concentrated in the land areas. After considerable study and deliberation, you conclude especially after perusing the databases and the information gathered from previous voyages, that this planet has indeed evolved life, and that the high oxygen content of Earth's atmosphere is somehow tied to the green pigment in many of the land areas of the planet. You conclude that there is a life form which has developed means of collecting solar energy from the sun, using the visible part of the sun spectrum together with carbon dioxide, to release oxygen and possibly water. It's clear that the green regions are thick and dense and do not consist of simply the typical inorganic matter, which we are used to seeing on the other lifeless planets. That green material consists of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen-based molecules. It's clear that such massive amounts of carbon on the surface could only come by use of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. Apparently, the green regions actively, dynamically produce oxygen, maintaining the unusually high atmospheric oxygen concentration. There is no evidence that these green regions are the actual source of the luminescence you observe or of the radio emissions you now so easily receive. There is some luminescence in the green regions, but it seems to be inconsistent. It seems to change, and it seems to indicate carbon combustion, the production of carbon dioxide, and of heat. The other areas of intense luminescence emit pure white light and seem to be an efficient form of light production. You conclude that this luminescence is intentional and is probably being produced or generated by an advanced life form. You further conclude that the reddish, heat-intensive luminescence produced primarily in those green regions is a simple oxidation reaction, combustion of those organic-rich entities which appear to be responsible for the thick green regions of the planet. As you view now at even higher resolution, you see very complex structures in the highly luminescent regions of the planet, patterns, arrays, Clearly, these are not random or apparently natural formations. On particularly clear regions of the planet's surface, your image intensified and enhanced cameras can actually detect strange creatures which move in relatively ordered paths. Your resolution is about 1 to 10 meters, the highest you can achieve without violating the galactic exploration code of ethics, thou shalt not touch or disturb. At this resolution, you see a variety of multicolored beings, highly smooth, reflective, ordered and controlled, apparently quite polite in a sense, and very purposeful. At night, these same beings appear to be the source of some of the luminescence. You conclude, the dominant life form on planet Earth is a, of a rigid, metallic-like character with highly reflective and colored surfaces approximately three or four meters in width by seven to 15 meters in length, and maybe one to two meters thick. The organism is hollow. Sounding measurements suggest that it is filled primarily with air, but often with some additional organic matter. It produces considerable heat and a variety of gaseous emissions, including carbon dioxide, 
carbon monoxide, and various oxides of nitrogen, as well as some water vapor. It seems to move in very purposeful, although somewhat dull and uninteresting, paths. This has been a most interesting voyage and expedition. You recall that there was an expedition made about 50 years ago, a brief and very rapid one. Some of their data is comparable to the data you have just gathered about planet Earth. However, there have been some interesting and substantive changes in the last 50 years. The green areas have decreased dramatically. The luminescent sources in the remaining green areas appear to be larger and more intense than they were 50 years ago. You now realize these are fires due to the combustion of the green organic matter on the land areas of the planet. It is clear that much of the green area is being removed, to be used apparently for other purposes. You note that there has been a significant increase in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in the last 50 years. This is correlated not only with the combustion in the green areas, but with the number of those three by seven meter metallic organisms, which have greatly multiplied in the last 50 years. It also seems to be correlated with the much greater luminescence intensity in the land areas of this planet. These activities are all apparently thermally very inefficient because we've noted a significant increase in the surface temperature of the planet. This increase is indeed planet-wide, although practically all of the activity responsible for this temperature increase is confined to the land areas of the planet. These temperature changes have begun to produce violent and unusual weather patterns in recent years. Fifty years ago, the expedition noted that the ozone concentration above the stratosphere or within the stratosphere, encompassed the entire planet. But on this expedition, you've concluded that the ozone concentration has significantly decreased in many areas of the planet. And the ozone is largely gone over the area called Antarctica and has diminished in the isolated areas called Australia and New Zealand. You predict that the actions and activities of these dominant metallic life forms is in some way coupled to the increasing CO2 concentration, the increasing temperature, and the decrease in ozone, as well as the significantly increased luminescence of this intriguing and fascinating planet. You would like to stay, but unfortunately you and your colleagues must leave this solar system and return home. Your next Starship exploration is scheduled for 30 years from now. <laughs> That's assuming no budget cuts or, or government problems at home. There are data to process, reports to write and file. As you turn back to the outer solar system, you take one last look at this apparently unique, special, living, colorful, and rapidly changing planet. While listening to some of the frequency modulated 100 or so megahertz television transmissions apparently emanating from the now ozone depleted region over southern Australia. It sounds like a breeze when you say it like that. Slip, slap, slap. In the sun this summer, say. Slip, slap, slap. Slip, slap, slap. Slip on a shirt, slap on sunscreen and slap on a hat. Slip, slap, slap. You can stop skin cancer, say. Slip, slap, slap. Slap, slap.